Chapter 11 When Ezio returned to Florence and broke the news to Duke Lorenzo of the death of the last of the Pazzi, Lorenzo was delighted but saddened that the security of Florence and of the Medici had had to be bought at the cost of so much blood. Lorenzo preferred to find diplomatic solutions to differences, but that desire made him an exception among his peers, the rulers of the other city-states of Italy. He rewarded Ezio with a ceremonial cape which conferred on him the freedom of the city of Florence. This is a most gracious gift, Altezza, Ezio told him, but I fear I will have little leisure to enjoy the benefits it confers on me. Lorenzo was surprised. What? Do you intend to leave again soon? I had hoped that you would stay, reopen your family palazzo, and take up a position in the city's administration, working with me. Ezio bowed, but said, I am sorry to say that it is my belief that our troubles have not come to an end with the fall of the Pazzi. They were but one tentacle of a greater beast. My intention now is to go to Venice. Venice? Yes. The man who was with Rodrigo Borgia at the meeting with Francesco is a member of the Barbarigo family. One of the most powerful families in La Serenissima. Are you saying this man is dangerous? He is allied to Rodrigo. Lorenzo considered for a moment, then spread his hands. I let you go with the utmost regret, Ezio, but I know that I shall never be out of your debt, which means, in turn, that I have no power to command you. Besides, I have a feeling that the work you are engaged on will in the long run be of benefit to our city, even though I may not live to see it. Don't say that, Altezza. Lorenzo smiled. I hope I am wrong. But living in this country at this time is like living on the rim of Vesuvius, dangerous and uncertain. Before leaving, Ezio brought news and gifts to Annetta, though it was painful to him to visit his former family home, and he would not enter it. He also studiously avoided the Calfucci mansion, but he did call on Paola and found her gracious but distracted, as if her mind were somewhere else. His last port of call was at his friend Leonardo's workshop, but when he got there he found only Agnolo and Innocento about, and the place had the look of being closed up. There was no sign of Leonardo. Agnolo smiled and greeted him as he arrived. Ciao, Ezio, it's been a long time. Too long. Ezio looked about him questioningly. You're wondering where Leonardo is? Has he left? Yes, but not forever. He's taken some of his material with him, but he couldn't take it all, so Innocento and I are looking after it while he's away. And where has he gone? It's funny. The maestro was in negotiations with the Sforza in Milan, but then the Conte de Pexaro invited him to spend some time in Venice. He's to complete a set of five family portraits. Agnolo smiled knowingly. As if that'll ever happen but it seems that the Council of Venice is interested in his engineering work and they're providing him with a workshop, staff, the lot. So, dear Ezio, if you need him, that is where you'll need to go. But that is exactly where I'm going, cried Ezio. This is splendid news. When did he leave? Two days ago. But you'll have no difficulty catching up with him. He's got a huge wagon absolutely loaded with his stuff and a couple of oxen to draw it. Any of his people with him. Just the wagoners and a couple of outriders in case of trouble. They've taken the Ravenna road. Ezio took with him only what he could pack into his saddlebags, and, travelling alone, had been riding only a day and a half when, at a bend in the road, he came upon a heavy ox-drawn cart equipped with a canvas canopy, beneath which any amount of machinery and models was carefully stowed. The wagoners stood at the side of the road, scratching their heads and looking hot and bothered, while the outriders, two slightly built boys armed with crossbows and lances, kept watch from a nearby knoll. Leonardo was nearby, apparently setting up some kind of leverage system, when he looked up and saw Ezio. 
Hello, Ezio. What luck. Leonardo, what's going on? I seem to have run into a bit of trouble. One of the cartwheels... He pointed to where one of the rear wheels had worked its way off the axle. The problem is that we need the wagon lifted clear so that we can refit the wheel. But we just don't have the manpower to do it. And this lever I've botched together isn't going to lift it high enough. So, do you think... Of course. Ezio beckoned to the two wagoners, heavily built men who'd be more used to him than the Lissom outriders, and between the three of them they were able to hoist the wagon up high enough and hold it there long enough for Leonardo to slip the wheel back onto the axle and peg it securely. While he was doing this, Ezio, straining with the others to keep the wagon up, looked in at its contents. Among them, unmistakably, was the bat-like structure he'd seen before. It looked as if it had undergone many modifications. Once the wagon had been repaired, Leonardo took up his seat on its front bench with one of the wagoners, while the other walked at the head of the oxen. The outriders patrolled restlessly both ahead and to the rear. Ezio kept his horse at a walk next to Leonardo, and they talked. It had been a very long time since their last meeting, and they had much to talk about. Ezio was able to bring Leonardo up to date, and Leonardo talked of his new commissions, and of his excitement at the prospect of seeing Venice. I'm so delighted to have you as a travelling companion. Mind you, you'd get there much faster if you didn't travel at my pace. It's a pleasure, and I want to make sure you get there safely. I have my outriders. Leonardo, don't misunderstand me, but even highwaymen still wet behind the ears could flick those two away as easily as you'd flick away a gnat. Leonardo looked surprised, then offended, then amused. Then I'm doubly glad of your company. He looked sly. And I have an idea it's not just for sentimental reasons that you'd like to see me get there in one piece. Ezio smiled, but did not reply. Instead, he said... I notice you're still working on that bat contraption. Eh? You know what I mean. Oh, that. It's nothing. Just something I've been tinkering away at. But I couldn't leave it behind. What is it? Leonardo was reluctant. I don't really like to talk about things before they're ready. Leonardo, you can trust me, surely. Ezio lowered his voice. After all, I've trusted you with secrets. Leonardo struggled with himself, then relaxed. All right, but you must tell no one else. Promesso. Anyone would think you mad if you did tell them, Leonardo continued, but his voice was excited. Listen, I think I have found a way to make a man fly. Ezio looked at him and laughed in total disbelief. I can see a time coming when you might want to wipe that smile off your face, said Leonardo good-naturedly. He changed the subject then and started to talk about Venice, La Serenissima, aloof from the rest of Italy, and often looking eastwards more than westwards, both for trade and in trepidation, for the Ottoman Turks held sway as far as halfway up the northern Adriatic coast these days. He talked of the beauty and the treachery of Venice of the city's dedication to money-making, of its richesse, its weird construction, a city of canals rising out of Fenland and built on a foundation of hundreds of thousands of huge wooden stakes, its ferocious independence and its political power. Not three hundred years earlier, the Doge of Venice had diverted an entire crusade from the Holy Land to serve his own purposes, to destroy all commercial and military competition and opposition to his city-state, and to bring the Byzantine Empire to its knees. He talked of the secret ink-dark backwaters, the towering candlelit palazzi, the curious dialect of Italian they spoke, the silence that hovered, the gaudy splendour of their dress, their magnificent painters, of whom the prince was Giovanni Bellini, whom Leonardo was eager to meet, of their music, their masked festivals, their flashy ability to show off, their mastery of the art of poisoning. 
And all this, he concluded, I know just from books. Imagine what the real thing will be like. It will be dirty and human, thought Ezio coldly, like everywhere else. But he showed his friend an agreeable smile. Leonardo was a dreamer. Dreamers should be allowed to dream. They had entered a gorge, and their voices echoed off its rocky sides. Ezio, scanning the almost invisible crests of the cliffs that hemmed them in on both sides, was suddenly tense. The outriders had gone on ahead, but he ought to have been able in this confined space to hear the clatter of their horses. However, no sound came. A light mist had sprung up, together with a sudden chill, neither of which did anything to reassure him. Leonardo was oblivious, but Ezio could see that the wagoners had become tense too, and were looking warily about them. Suddenly, a scattering of small pebbles came clattering down the rocky side of the gorge, causing Ezio's horse to shy. He looked up, squinting against the indifferent sun high above, against which he could see an eagle soar. Now even Leonardo was aware. What's wrong? he asked. We're not alone, said Ezio. There may be enemy archers up on the cliffs above us. But then he heard the thundering hooves of horses, several horses, approaching them from behind. Ezio wheeled his horse to see half a dozen cavalry approaching. The banner they bore was a red cross on a yellow shield. Borgia, he muttered, drawing his sword as a crossbow bolt hammered into the side of the wagon. The wagoners themselves were already fleeing up the road ahead, and even the oxen were affected, for they lumbered slowly forward of their own volition. Take the reins and keep them going, Ezio cried to Leonardo. It's me they're after, not you. Just keep going, whatever happens. Leonardo hastened to obey as Ezio rode back to meet the horsemen. His sword, one of Mario's, was well balanced by its pommel, and his horse was lighter and more manoeuvrable than those of his adversaries. But they were well armoured, and there would be no chance to use his codex blades. Ezio dug his heels into the flanks of his horse, spurring it on into the thick of the enemy. Ducking low in the saddle, Ezio smashed into the group, the force of his charge causing two of their horses to rear violently. Then the swordplay began in earnest. The protective brace he wore on his left forearm deflected many blows, however, and he was able to take advantage of the surprise of a foeman when he saw that his blow did not land to get in a meaningful blow of his own. It was not long before he had unseated four of the men, leaving the two survivors to wheel round and gallop back the way they had come. This time, however, he knew that he must allow no one even the chance of getting back to Rodrigo. He galloped after them, cutting first one and then the other down off his horse as he caught up with them. He searched the bodies swiftly, but neither yielded anything of note. Then he dragged them to the roadside and covered them with rocks and stones. He remounted and rode back, pausing only to clear the road of the other corpses and give them a rudimentary burial, at least enough to conceal them with the stones and brushwood he had at hand. There was nothing he could do about their horses, which by now had run away. Ezio had escaped Rodrigo's vengeance once more, but he knew the Borgia Cardinal would not give up until he was assured of his death. He dug his heels into his horse's flanks and rode to rejoin Leonardo. When he caught up, they looked for the wagoners and called their names in vain. I paid them a huge deposit on this wagon and oxen, grumbled Leonardo. I don't suppose I'll ever see it again. Sell them in Venice. Don't they use gondolas there? Plenty of farms on the mainland. Leonardo looked at him. By God, Ezio, I like a practical man. Their long cross-country journey continued, past the ancient town of Forli, now a small city-state in its own right and on to Ravenna and its port on the coast a few miles beyond. There they took ship, a coastal galley on its way from Ancona to Venice, and once he had ascertained that no one else on board presented any danger, Ezio managed to relax a little. 
that he was aware that even on a relatively small ship like this, it would not be too difficult to slit someone's throat at night and cast their body into the blue-black waters, and he watched alertly the comings and goings at every little harbour they put into. However, they arrived several days later at the Venice dockyards without incident. Only here did Ezio encounter his next setback, and that was from an unexpected source. They had disembarked and were waiting now for the local ferry, which would take them to the island city. It duly arrived, and sailors helped Leonardo move his wagon onto the boat, which wallowed alarmingly under its weight. The ferry captain told Leonardo that some of the Conte da Pexaro's staff would be waiting on the quay to conduct him to his new quarters, and with a bow and a smile handed him on board. You have your pass, of course, signore? Of course, said Leonardo, handing the man a paper. And you, sir? inquired the captain politely, turning to Ezio. Ezio was taken aback. He had arrived without an invitation, unaware of this local law. But I have no pass, he said. It's all right, put in Leonardo, speaking to the captain. He is with me. I can vouch for him, and I am sure that the Conte— but the captain held up a hand. I regret, signore. The rules of the council are explicit. No one may enter the city of Venice without a pass. Leonardo was about to remonstrate, but Ezio stopped him. Don't worry, Leonardo. I'll find a way round this. I wish I could help you, sir, said the captain, but I have my orders. In a louder voice directed at the crowd of passengers in general, he announced, Attention, please! Attention, please! The ferry will depart at the stroke of ten. Ezio knew that gave him a little time. His attention was caught by an extremely well-dressed couple, whom he had noticed joining the galley at the same time as he had, who had taken the best cabin, and who had kept very much to themselves. Now they were alone at the foot of one of the piers, where several private gondolas were moored, and clearly in the middle of a very acrimonious row. "'My beloved, please,' the man was saying, a weak-looking type, and twenty years older than his companion, a spirited redhead with fiery eyes. "'Girolamo, you are nothing but a fool. God knows why I ever married you, but he also knows how much I've suffered as a result. You never cease to find fault. You keep me cooped up like a chicken in your horrible little provincial town, and now, now— you can't even organise a gondola to get us to Venice. And when I think your uncle's the bloody Pope, no less, you'd think you'd be able to exert some influence. But look at you. You've got about as much backbone as a slug. Caterina. Don't you Caterina me, you toad. Just get the men to deal with the luggage, and for God's sake get me to Venice. I need a bath, and I need wine. Girolamo bridled. I have a good mind to leave you here and go on to Pordenone without you. We should have gone by land in any case. It's too dangerous travelling by road. Yes, for a spineless creature like you. Girolamo was silent as Ezio continued to watch. Then he said cunningly, Why don't you step into this gondola here? He indicated one. And I will find a pair of gondoliers immediately. Hm, talking sense at last, she growled and allowed him to hand her into the boat. But once she was settled, Girolamo quickly cast off its painter and gave the prow a mighty shove, sending the gondola off into the lagoon. Buon viaggio, he shouted nastily. Bastardo, she flung back. Then, realizing her predicament, she began to shout, Aiuto, aiuto! But Girolamo was walking back to where a knot of servants hovered uncertainly round a stack of luggage, and started giving them orders. Presently he moved off with them and the baggage to another part of the dock, where he started organising a private ferry for himself. Meanwhile, Ezio had watched the plight of the woman, Caterina, half amused, certainly, but also half concerned. She fixed him with her eye. "'Hey, you! Don't just stand there! I need help!' Ezio unbuckled his sword, slipped off his shoes and doublet, and dived in. 
back on the quay, a smiling Katerina gave a dripping Ezio her hand. My hero, she said. It was nothing. I might have drowned, for all that porco cares. She looked at Ezio appreciatively. But you, my goodness, you must be strong. I couldn't believe how you managed to swim back, pulling the gondola by its rope, with me in it. As light as a feather, said Ezio. Flatterer. I mean, those boats are so well balanced. Caterina frowned. It was an honour to serve you, Signora. Ezio finished, lamely. I must return the favour some day, she said, her eyes full of the meaning behind her words. What is your name? Auditore, Ezio. I'm Caterina, she paused. Where are you bound? I was going to Venice, but I have no pass, so the ferry. Basta, she interrupted him. So this little official wouldn't let you on, is that it? Yes. We'll see about that. She stormed off down the jetty without waiting for Ezio to put on his shoes and doublet. By the time he caught up with her, she had reached the ferry and was already, from what he could gather, giving the quaking man an earful. All he could hear as he arrived was the captain burbling in the most servile way. Yes, Altezza, of course, Altezza. Whatever you say, Altezza. It had better be as I say, unless you want your head on a spike. Here he is. Go and fetch his horse and his things yourself. Go on, and treat him well. I'll know about it if you don't. The captain hurried away. Caterina turned to Ezio. There, you see? Settled. Thank you, Madonna. One good turn. She looked at him. But I hope our paths cross again. She held out her hand. I am from Forli. Come there one day. It would be my pleasure to welcome you. She gave him her hand and was about to depart. Don't you want to get to Venice too? She looked at him again and at the ferry. On this scrap heap. Don't jest with me. And she was gone, sailing along the quay in the direction of her husband, who was just seeing the last of their luggage loaded. The captain scuttled up, leading Ezio's horse. Here you are, sir. My most humble apologies, sir. Had I but known, sir. I'll need my horse stabled when we arrive. It'll be my pleasure, sir. As the ferry pulled away and set off across the lead-coloured water of the lagoon, Leonardo, who'd watched the whole episode, said wryly, "'You know who that was, don't you?' "'I wouldn't mind if she were my next conquest,' smiled Ezio. "'Then watch your step. "'That's Caterina Sforza, the daughter of the Duke of Milan, "'and her husband's the Duke of Forli, and a nephew of the Pope. "'What's his name?' Girolamo Riario. Ezio was silent. The surname rang a bell. Then he said, Well, he married a fireball. As I say, replied Leonardo, watch your step. Chapter 12 Venice in 1481 under the steady rule of Doge Giovanni Mocenigo, was on the whole a good place to be. There was peace with the Turks, the city prospered, the trade routes by sea and land were secure, interest rates were admittedly high, but investors were bullish and savers content. The church was wealthy too, and artists flourished under the dual patronage of their spiritual and temporal patrons. The city, rich from the wholesale looting of Constantinople after the Fourth Crusade, diverted by Doge Dandolo from its true object, had brought Byzantium to its knees, displayed the booty unashamedly. The four bronze horses ranged along the upper façade of St. Mark's Basilica, being the most obvious. But Leonardo and Ezio, arriving at the Molo on that early summer morning, had no idea of the city's debased, treacherous, and pilfering past. They only saw the glory of the pink marble and brickwork of the Palazzo Ducale, the broad square reaching forwards and to the left, the brick campanile of astonishing height, 
and the slightly built Venetians themselves, in their dark clothes splitting like shadows along the terra firma, or navigating their labyrinthine, malodorous canals in a variety of boats, from elegant gondolas to ungainly barges, the latter laden with all sorts of produce, from fruit to bricks. The Conte da Pexaro's servants took charge of Leonardo's effects, and at his suggestion also took charge of Ezio's horse, and further promised to arrange suitable lodgings for the young banker's son from Florence. They then dispersed, leaving one behind, a fat, sallow young man with bulging eyes, whose shirt was damp with sweat, and whose smile would have made syrup hang its head in shame. Altezze, he simpered, approaching them. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Nero, the Conte's personal funzionario da Colienza. It will be my duty and my pleasure to offer you a short guided introduction to our proud city before the Conte receives you. Here Nero looked nervously between Leonardo and Ezio, trying to decide which of the two was the commissioned artist and luckily for him settled on Leonardo, the one who looked less like a man of action. Messer Leonardo, for a glass of veneto before dinner, which meal Messer will be pleased to take in the upper servant's hall. He bowed and scraped a little more, for good measure. Our gondola awaits. For the next half hour Ezio and Leonardo were able indeed obliged to enjoy the beauties of La Serenissima from the best place that it is possible to enjoy them, a gondola, expertly managed by its fore-and-aft gondoliers. But the enjoyment was marred by Nero's oily spiel. Ezio, despite his interest in the unique beauty and architecture of this place, still wet from his rescue of Madonna Caterina, and tired, tried to find refuge in sleep from Nero's dreary monologuing. But suddenly he snapped awake. Something had caught his attention. From the canal bank, not far from the palace of the Marchese de Ferrara, Ezio heard raised voices. Two armed guards were harassing a businessman. "'You were told to stay at home, sir,' said one of the uniforms. "'But the rent is paid. I have every right to sell my wares here.' Sorry, sir, but it's in contravention of Messer Emilio's new rules. I'm afraid you're in rather a serious situation, sir. I'll appeal to the Council of Ten. No time for that, sir, said the second uniform, kicking down the awning of the businessman's stall. The man was selling leather goods, and the uniforms between them, while pocketing the best, threw most of his wares into the canal. Now, let's not have any more of this nonsense, sir said one of the uniforms as they swaggered off unhurriedly. "'What's going on?' Ezio asked Nero. "'Nothing, Altezza. A little local difficulty. I beg you to ignore. "'And now we are about to pass under the famous wooden bridge of the Rialto, "'the only bridge over the Grand Canal, famed in all history for—' "'Ezio was happy to let the poor bugger ramble on.' but what he had seen had disturbed him, and he had heard the name Emilio. A common enough Christian name, but Emilio Barbarigo? Not long afterwards, Leonardo insisted that they stop so that he could look at a market with stands selling children's toys. He went up to the one that had caught his eye immediately. Look, Ezio, he cried. What have you found? It's a lay figure a little articulated mannequin we artists use as models. I could do with a couple. Would you be so kind? I seem to have sent my purse with my bags to my new workshop. But as Ezio was reaching for his own purse, a bunch of young people pushed past them, and one of them tried to cut his purse from his belt. Hey! yelled Ezio. Coglione! Stop! And he raced after them, the one he'd marked as his attacker turned for an instant, pushing a tress of auburn hair clear of the face. A woman's face. But then she was gone, vanishing into the crowd with her companions. They resumed their tour in silence, Leonardo, however, now contentedly clutching his two lay figures. 
Ezio was impatient to be rid of the buffoon who was their guide, and even of Leonardo. He needed time alone, time to think. And now we approach the famous Palazzo Seta, Nero droned on, home of Su Altezza Emilio Barbarigo. Messer Barbarigo is famous at present for his attempts to unify the merchants of the city under his guiding control, a laudable undertaking which has, alas, encountered some resistance from the more radical elements in the city. A grim fortified building stood back from the canal, allowing for a flagstoned space in front of it, at whose key three gondolas were moored. As their own gondola passed, Ezio noticed the same businessman he had seen harassed earlier try to enter the building. He was being held back by two more guards, and Ezio noticed on their shoulders a yellow blazon crossed with a red chevron, below it a black horse, above it a dolphin, star, and grenade. Barbarigo men, of course. My stall has been destroyed, my goods ruined, I demand compensation, the businessman was saying in an angry tone. Sorry, sir, we closed, said one of the uniforms, poking the poor man with his halberd. I haven't finished with you. I'll report you to the council. Much good may it do you, snapped the older, second uniform. But now an officer and three more men appeared. Causing an affray, are we, sir? No, I... Arrest this man, barked the officer. What are you doing? said the businessman, frightened. Ezio watched, powerless and in growing anger, but he had marked the place in his mind. The businessman was dragged off in the direction of the building, where a small iron-clad door opened to admit him, and immediately closed behind him. You haven't chosen the best of places, though it may be the prettiest, Ezio told Leonardo. I'm beginning to wish that I'd plumped for Milan after all, replied Leonardo. But a job is a job. Chapter 13 After Ezio had taken leave of Leonardo and settled into his own lodgings, he wasted no time in making his way back to the Palazzo Seta, not an easy task in this city of alleyways, twisting canals, low arches, little squares and dead ends. But everyone knew the palazzo, and locals willingly gave him directions when he got lost, though they all seemed at a loss as to why anybody should wish to go there of their own free will. One or two suggested that it would be simplest for him to take a gondola, but Ezio wanted to familiarise himself with the city, as well as to arrive at his goal unnoticed. It was late afternoon as he approached the palazzo, though it was less of a palace than a fortress, or a prison since the main building complex had been erected within the battlemented walls. On either side it was hemmed in by other buildings which were separated from it by narrow streets, but to its rear was what looked like a sizable garden surrounded by another high wall, and at the front, facing the canal, was the wide, open area Ezio had seen earlier. Here now, though, a pitched battle seemed to be taking place between a bunch of Barbarigo guardsmen and a motley group of young people who were taunting them, and then skipping lightly out of reach of their swinging halberds and stabbing pikes, throwing bricks, stones, and rotten eggs and fruit at the infuriated uniforms. Perhaps they were just creating a diversion, for Ezio, looking beyond them, could see a figure scaling the wall of the palazzo beyond the scene of the melee. Ezio was impressed. The wall was so sheer that even he would have thought twice about tackling it. But whoever it was reached the battlements without detection or difficulty, and then, astoundingly, leapt up from them to land on the roof of one of the watchtowers. Ezio could see that the person was planning to jump again from there to the roof of the palace itself, and try to gain access to the interior from there, and he made a note of the tactic should he ever need, or be able, to use it himself. But the guards in the watchtower had heard the person land, and called a warning to their fellows on guard in the palace proper. A bowman appeared at a window in the eaves of the palace roof and fired. The figure jumped gracefully, and the arrow went wide, 
clattering off the tiles, but the second time the archer fired his aim was true, and with a faint cry the figure staggered, clutching a wounded thigh. The bowman fired again, but missed, since the figure had retraced its steps, skipping from the tower roof back down to the battlements, along which other guardsmen were already running, then leapt back over the wall and half slid, half fell down it to the ground. On the other side of the open space in front of the palazzo, the Barbarigo guards were pushing their attackers back into the alleyways beyond, down which they were beginning to pursue them. Ezio took this opportunity to catch up with the figure, which was beginning to limp away to safety in the opposite direction. When he caught up, he was struck by the person's light, boy-like but athletic shape. As he was about to offer his assistance, the person turned towards him and he recognised the face of the girl who tried to cut his purse in the market earlier. He found himself surprised, confused and, curiously, smitten. Give me your arm, said the girl urgently. Don't you remember me? Should I? I'm the one you tried to rob in the market today. I'm sorry, but this is no time for comfortable reminiscences. If we don't get out of sight fast, we'll be dead meat. As if to illustrate her point, an arrow whizzed past between them. Ezio put her arm round his shoulders and his round her waist, supporting her as he had once supported Lorenzo. Where to? The canal. Of course, he said sarcastically, there's only one in Venice, isn't there? You're damn cocky for a newcomer. This way I'll show you, but be quick. Look, they're after us already. And it was true that a small detachment of men had started across the cobblestones towards them. One hand gripping her wounded thigh and tense with pain, she guided Ezio down an alley, which led to another and another and another until Ezio had lost all sense of the compass points. Behind them, the voices of the men pursuing them gradually receded and then were lost. Hirelings brought in from the mainland, said the girl in tones of great contempt. Don't stand a chance in this city against us locals. Get lost too easily. Come on. They had arrived at a jetty on the Canale della Misericordia. A nondescript boat was tied up there with two men in it. On seeing Ezio and the girl, one immediately started to unloop the mooring rope, while the other helped them in. Who's he? The second man asked the girl. No idea, but he was in the right place at the right time, and apparently he's no friend of Emilio's. But she was close to fainting now. Wounded in the thigh, said Ezio. I can't take that out now, said the man, looking at the bolt where it had lodged. I haven't got any balsam or bandages here. We must get her back fast, and before those sewer rats of Emilio's catch up with us. He looked at Ezio. Who are you, anyway? My name is Auditore, Ezio, from Florence. Hmm. Mine's Ugo. She's Rosa, and the guy up there with the paddle is Paganino. We don't like strangers much. Who are you? Ezio replied, ignoring the last remark. Professional liberators of other people's property, said Ugo. Thieves, explained Paganino with a laugh. You take the poetry out of everything, said Ugo, sadly. And then he suddenly became alert. Watch out, he yelled, as one arrow, then another, thudded into the hull of the boat from somewhere above. Looking up, they could see two Barbarigo bowmen on a nearby rooftop, fitting fresh arrows to their longbows. Hugo scrabbled in the well of the boat and came up with a businesslike, stubby crossbow, which he quickly loaded, aimed and fired, while at the same time Ezio flung two throwing knives in quick succession at the other archer. Both bowmen plunged, screaming, into the canal below. "'That bastard's got goons everywhere,' said Ugo to Paganino in a conversational tone. They were both short, broad-shouldered, tough-looking men in their twenties. They handled the boat skillfully and evidently knew the canal system like the backs of their hands, for more than once Ezio was convinced they had turned into the aquatic version of a blind alley, only to find that it ended not in a brick wall, 
but a low arch under which the boat could just pass if they all bent low. What were you doing attacking the Palazzo Seta? Ezio asked. What's it to you? answered Ugo. Emilio Barbarigo is no friend of mine. Perhaps we can help each other. What makes you think we need your help? retorted Ugo. Come on, Ugo, said Rosa. Look what he's just done. And you're also overlooking the fact that he saved my life. I'm the best climber of the lot of us. Without me, we'll never get inside that viper's nest. She turned her face to Ezio. Emilio is trying to get a monopoly on trade within the city. He's a powerful man and he has several councillors in his pocket. It's getting to the stage when any businessman who defies him and tries to maintain his independence is simply silenced. But you aren't merchants. You're thieves. Professional thieves, she corrected him. Individual businesses, individual shops, individual people, they all make for easier pickings than any corporate monopoly. Anyway, they have insurance, and the insurance companies pay up after fleecing their customers of giant premiums, so everyone's happy. Emilio would turn Venice into a desert for the likes of us. Not to mention that he's a piece of shit who wants to take over not just local business, but the city itself, put in Ugo. But Antonio will explain. Antonio? Who's he? You'll find out soon enough, Mr. Florentine. At last they reached another jetty and tied up, moving quickly, since Rosa's wound needed to be cleaned and treated if she were not to die. Leaving Paganino with the boat, Ugo and Ezio between them half-dragged, half-carried Rosa, who had by now all but lost consciousness from loss of blood, the short distance down yet another twisting lane of dark red brick and wood to a small square, a well, and a tree at its centre, and surrounded by dirty-looking buildings from which the stucco had long since peeled. They made their way to the dirty crimson door of one of the buildings, and Ugo wrapped a complex pattern of knocks on it. A peephole opened and shut, and the door was swiftly opened and as swiftly closed. Whatever else had been neglected, Ezio noticed, hinges and locks and bolts were well-oiled and free of rust. He found himself in a shabby courtyard surrounded by high, streaky grey walls which were punctuated by windows. Two wooden staircases ran up on either side to join wooden galleries that ran all round the walls at first and second floor level, and from which a number of doorways led. A handful of people, some of whom Ezio recognised from the melee outside the Palazzo Seta earlier, gathered round. Ugo was already issuing orders. Where's Antonio? Go get him. And clear some space for Rosa. Get a blanket, some balsam, hot water, a sharp knife, bandages. A man raced up one of the staircases and vanished through a first-floor doorway. Two women unrolled a very nearly clean mat and laid Rosa tenderly down on it. A third disappeared to return with the medical kit Ugo had requested. Rosa recovered consciousness, saw Ezio, and reached a hand out to him. He took her hand and knelt down by her. Where are we? I think this must be your people's headquarters. In any case, you're safe. She squeezed his hand. I'm sorry I tried to rob you. Think nothing of it. Thank you for saving my life. Ezio looked anxious. She was very pale. They would have to work fast if they were indeed going to save her. Don't worry, Antonio will know what to do, Ugo told him as he stood up again. Hurrying down one of the staircases came a well-dressed man in his late thirties, a large gold earring in his left earlobe, and a scarf on his head. He made straight for Rosa and knelt by her, snapping his fingers for the medical kit. Antonio, she said. What's happened to you, my little darling? he said in the harsh accent of the born Venetian. Just get this thing out of me, snarled Rosa. Let me take a look first, said Antonio, his voice suddenly more serious. He examined the wound carefully. Clean entry and exit through your thigh, Mr. Bone. Lucky it wasn't a crossbow bolt. 
Rosa gritted her teeth. Just get it out. Give us something to bite on, said Antonio. He snapped off the arrow's fletching, wrapped a cloth round the head, soaked the points of entry and exit with balsam, and pulled. Rosa spat out the wadding they'd placed between her teeth and screamed. I'm sorry, Piccola, said Antonio, keeping his hands pressed on both points of the wound. Go fuck yourself with your apologies, Antonio, yelped Rosa, as the women held her down. Antonio looked up to one of his entourage. Mikhail, go and fetch Bianca. He cast a sharp eye on Ezio. And you, help me with this. Take those compresses and hold them on the wounds as soon as I remove my hands, and we can bandage her properly. Ezio hastened to obey. He felt the warmth of Rosa's upper thigh under his hands, felt the reaction of her body to them, and tried not to meet her eyes. Meanwhile, Antonio worked quickly, elbowing Ezio aside at last, and finally gently articulating Rosa's immaculately bandaged leg. Good, he said. It'll be a while before we have you scaling any battlements again, but I think you'll make a full recovery. Just be patient. I know you. Did you have to hurt me so much, you clumsy idiota? She flared at him. I hope you catch the plague, you bastard. You and your whore of a mother. Take her inside, said Antonio, smiling. Ugo, go with her. Make sure she gets some rest. Four of the women picked up the corners of the mat and carried the still protesting Rosa through one of the ground floor doors. Antonio watched them go, then turned again to Ezio. Thank you, he said. That little bitch is most dear to me. If I had lost her, Ezio shrugged. I've always had a soft spot for damsels in distress. I'm glad Rosa didn't hear you say that, Ezio Auditore. But your reputation goes before you. I didn't hear Ugo tell you my name, said Ezio, on his guard. He didn't. But we know all about your work in Florence and San Gimignano. Good work, too, if a little unrefined. Who are you people? Antonio spread his hands. Welcome to the headquarters of the Guild of Professional Thieves and Whoremongers of Venice, he said. I am Demigianis, Antonio, the Amministratore. He gave an ironic bow. But of course we only steal from the rich to give to the poor. And of course our whores prefer to call themselves courtesans. And you know why I am here? Antonio smiled. I have an idea. But it's not one I've shared with any of my employees. Come, we should go to my office and talk. The office reminded Ezio so vividly of Uncle Mario's study that at first he was taken aback. He didn't know what he had expected exactly, but here he was confronted by a book-lined room, expensive books in good bindings, fine Ottoman carpets, walnut and boxwood furniture, and silver gilt sconces and candelabras. The room was dominated by a table at its centre, on which sat a large-scale model of the Palazzo Seta and its immediate environs. Innumerable tiny wooden mannequins were distributed around and within it. Antonio waved Ezio to a chair, and busied himself over a comfortable-looking stove in one corner, from which a curiously attractive but unfamiliar smell wafted. Can I offer you something? Antonio said. He reminded Ezio so much of Uncle Mario that it was uncanny. Biscotti! Un café! Excuse me, a what? A coffee! Antonio straightened himself. It's an interesting concoction, brought to me by a Turkish merchant. Here, try some and he passed Ezio a tiny white porcelain cup filled with a hot black liquid from which the pungent aroma came. Ezio tasted it. It burned his lips, but it wasn't bad, and he said so, but added, injudiciously, 
It might be better with cream and sugar. The most certain way to ruin it, snapped Antonio, offended. They finished their coffees, however, and Ezio soon felt a certain nervous, energetic buzz that was new to him. He would have to tell Leonardo about this drink when he next saw him. As for now, Antonio was pointing at the model of the Palazzo Seta. These were the positions we had planned if Rosa had succeeded in getting in and opening one of the postern gates. But as you know, she was seen and shot, and we had to withdraw. Now we will have to regroup, and in the meantime Emilio will have time to strengthen his defences. Worse than that, this operation was costly. I'm almost down to my last soldo. Emilio must be loaded, said Ezio. Why not attack again now and relieve him of his money? Don't you listen. Our resources are under strain and he is on the alert. We could never overcome him without the element of surprise. Besides, he has two powerful cousins, the brothers Marco and Agostino, to back him up. Though I believe Agostino at least to be a good man. As for Mochinigo, well, the Doge is a good man but he is unworldly and leaves matters of business to others, others who are already in Emilio's pocket. He looked hard at Ezio. We need help to fill our coffers again. I think you may be able to provide that help. If you do, it will demonstrate to me that you are an ally worth helping. Might you undertake such a mission, Mr. Cream and Sugar? Ezio smiled. Try me he said. Chapter 14 It took a long time, and Ezio's interview with the sceptical chief treasurer of the Thieves' Guild had been uncomfortable, but Ezio was able to use the skills he'd learned from Paola to cut purses with the best of them, and to rob the rich burghers of Venice, allied with Emilio, of as much as he could get. A few months later, in the company of other thieves, for he was now an honorary member of the guild, he had brought in the two thousand ducati Antonio needed to relaunch his operation against Emilio. But there was a cost. Not all the guild members had escaped capture and arrest by the Barbarigo guards, so that while the thieves now had the funds they needed, their manpower had been depleted. But Emilio Barbarigo made an arrogant mistake. To make an example of them, he placed the captured thieves on public display in cramped iron cages around the district he controlled. If he'd kept them in the dungeons of his palazzo, God himself would not have been able to get them out. But Emilio preferred to show them off, deprived of food and water, prodded with sticks by his guards whenever they sought sleep, and meant to starve them to death in full public view. They won't last six days without water, let alone food, Ugo said to Ezio. What does Antonio say? That it's up to you to plan a rescue. How much more proof of my loyalty does the man need, thought Ezio, before he realised that he already had Antonio's confidence, to the extent that the Prince of Thieves was entrusting to him this most crucial mission. He hadn't much time. Carefully, Ugo and he observed in secret the comings and goings of the watch. It appeared that one group of guards continuously passed from one cage to the next. Though each cage was constantly surrounded by a clutch of curious rubberneckers, among whom there may well have been Barbarigo spies, Ezio and Ugo decided to take the risk. On the night shift, when there were far fewer observers about, they made their way to the first cage when the guard was just about to leave for the second. Once the guard had departed, and were out of sight and earshot, they managed to spring the locks, their spirits raised by a desultory cheer from the handful of bystanders, who couldn't care less one way or the other who had the upper hand, so long as they were entertained, and some of whom followed them to the second cage, and even to the third. The men and women they liberated, twenty-seven in number, were already, after two and a half days, in a sorry plight. But at least they had not been individually manacled, 
and Ezio led them to the wells that could be found in the centre of almost every frequent square, so that their first and most important need, thirst, was satisfied. At the end of the mission, which took from candlelight until cockcrow, Ugo and his liberated associates looked at Ezio with deep respect. Rescuing my brothers and sisters was more than just an act of charity, Ezio, said Ugo. These colleagues will play a vital role in the weeks to come. And, his tone became solemn, our guild owes you an undying debt of gratitude. The group had arrived back at the guild's headquarters. Antonio embraced Ezio, but his face was grave. How is Rosa? asked Ezio. Better. But she was hurt worse than we thought, and she tries to run before she can walk. Sounds like her. It's typical. Antonio paused. She wants to see you. I'm flattered. Why be? You're the hero of the hour. Some days later, Ezio was summoned to Antonio's office and found him poring over his model of the Palazzo Seta. The little wooden mannequins had been redeployed around it, and there was a pile of papers covered in calculations and notes on the table by its side. Ah, Ezio, signore. I've just returned from a little foray of my own into enemy territory. We managed to liberate three boatloads of armoury destined for dear Emilio's little palazzo, so we thought we might organise a little fancy dress party with us dressed in the uniforms of Barbarigo archers. Brilliant. That should get us into his fortress without any problem. When do we start? Antonio held up a hand. Not so fast, my dear. There is a problem, and I'd like to ask your advice. You honour me. No, I just value your judgment. The fact is, I have it on the best authority that some of my people have been suborned by Emilio and are now his agents. He paused. We cannot strike until the traitors are dealt with. Look, I know I can depend on you, and your face is not well known within the guild. If I were able to give you certain pointers about the whereabouts of these traitors... Do you think you could deal with them? You can take Ugo with you as backup, and whatever task force you may require. Messer Antonio, the fall of Emilio is as important to me as it is to you. Let us join hands in this. Antonio smiled. The very answer I expected from you. He gestured Ezio to join him at a map table which had been set up near the window. Here is a plan of the city. The men of mine who have defected meet, as my own loyal spies tell me, in a taverna here. It's called Il Vecchio Specchio. There they make contact with Emilio's agents, exchange information, and take their orders. How many? Five. But what do you want me to do with them? Antonio looked at him. Why, kill them, my friend. Ezio summoned the group he had hand-picked for the mission the following day, at sunset. He had laid his plans. He dressed them all in Barbarigo uniforms from the boats Antonio had sequestered. Emilio, he knew from Antonio, believed that the stolen equipment had been lost at sea, so his people would suspect nothing. Together with Ugo and four others, he descended on Il Vecchio Specchio soon after dark. It was a Barbarigo hangout, but at that time of night only a handful of customers were there, apart from the turncoats and their Barbarigo controls. They hardly looked up as they saw a group of Barbarigo guards enter the inn, and it was only when they were surrounded that their attention turned to the newcomers. Ugo pulled back his hood, revealing himself in the half-light of the taverna. The conspirators made to rise astonishment and fear written in their faces. Ezio placed a firm hand on the shoulder of the nearest traitor, then with a detached economy of effort, thrust his now-released codex blade between the man's eyes. Ugo and the others followed suit, 
and dispatched their traitorous brethren. In the meantime, Rosa had continued to make a gradual and ever impatient recovery. She was up and about, but she depended on a cane to get around, and her damaged leg was still swathed in bandages. Ezio, despite himself, and constantly making mental apologies to Cristina Carfucci, spent as much of his time as he could in her company. Salute, Rosa, he said on a typical morning. How are things? I see your leg is healing. Rosa shrugged. It's taking forever, but I'm getting there. And you? How are you finding our little town? It is a great city. But how do you cope with the smell of the canals? We're used to it. We wouldn't like the dust and filth of Florence. She paused. So, what brings you to me this time? Ezio smiled. What do you think, and also not what do you think? He hesitated. I was hoping you could teach me how to climb like you do. She tapped her leg. Time was, she said. But if you are in a hurry, my friend Franco can do almost as well as me. She raised her voice. Franco! A listen, dark-haired youth appeared almost instantly in the doorway, and Ezio, to his private mortification, felt a pang of jealousy that was apparent enough for Rosa to notice. She smiled. Don't worry, Tesoro. He's as gay as Santo Sebastiano. But he's also as tough as old boots. Franco, I want you to show Ezio some of our tricks. She looked out of the window. An unoccupied building opposite was covered with bamboo scaffolding tied together with leather thongs. She pointed. Take him up that for a start. Ezio spent the rest of the morning, three hours, chasing after Franco under Rosa's strident direction. At the end of it, he could clamber up to a giddying height with almost all the speed and address of his mentor, and had learned how to jump upwards from one handhold to the next, though he doubted if he'd ever reach Rosa's own standard. Lunch likely, Rosa said, sparing him any praise. We haven't finished for the day. In the afternoon, in the hours of the siesta, she took him to the square of the massive red-brick Frari church. Together they looked up at its bulk. Climb that, Rosa said, up to the very top, and I want you back down here before I've counted three hundred. Ezio sweated and strained, his head swimming with the effort. Four hundred and thirty-nine, announced Rosa when he rejoined her. Again. At the end of the fifth attempt, an exhausted and sweating Ezio felt that all he wanted to do now was smash Rosa in the face but that desire melted when she smiled at him and said, Two hundred and ninety-three. You'll just about do. The small crowd that had gathered applauded. Chapter 15 Over the following months, the Thieves' Guild tackled the tasks of reorganizing and refitting. Then, one morning, Ugo arrived at Ezio's lodgings to invite him to a meeting. Ezio packed his codex weapons in a satchel and followed Ugo to the headquarters, where they found Antonio in an ebullient mood, once again moving the little wooden mannequins around the model of the Palazzo Seta. Ezio wondered if the man wasn't a little obsessed. Rosa, Franco and two or three of the other senior members of the guild were also present. Ah, Ezio, he smiled. Thanks to your recent successes, we are now in a position to counterattack. Our target is Emilio's warehouse, not far from his palazzo. This is the plan. Look. He tapped the model and indicated lines of little blue wooden soldiers ranged around the perimeters of the warehouse. These are Emilio's archers. They represent our greatest danger. Under cover of night... I intend to send you and a couple of others up to the roofs of the buildings adjoining the warehouse, and I know that you are up to this task thanks to Rosa's recent training, 
to drop down on the archers and dispose of them, quietly. As you do so, our men, dressed in the Barbarigo uniforms we've captured, will move in from the alleyways around and take their places. Ezio pointed to the red mannequins within the warehouse walls. What about the guards inside? When you've dealt with the archers, we'll gather here. Antonio pointed to a piazza nearby, which Ezio recognised as the one where Leonardo had his new workshop. He wondered briefly how his friend was progressing with his commissions, and discuss the next steps. When do we make our move? asked Ezio. Tonight. Excellent. Let me have a couple of good men. Ugo, Franco, are you with me? The two nodded, grinning. We'll take care of the archers and meet you as you suggest. With our men in place of their archers, they won't suspect a thing. And the next move? Once we've secured the warehouse, we'll launch an attack on the palazzo itself. But remember, be stealthy. They must not suspect a thing. Antonio grinned and spat. Good luck, my friends. In bocca lupo, he patted Ezio's shoulder. Crepe lupo, Ezio replied, spitting too. The operation passed off that night without a hitch. The Barbarigo archers didn't know what had hit them, and so subtly were they replaced with Antonio's men that the guards inside the warehouse fell quietly and without much resistance to the thieves' onslaught, having been unaware that their comrades outside had been neutralised. The attack on the palazzo was next on Antonio's agenda, but Ezio insisted that he went ahead first to assess the lie of the land. Rosa, the last stages of whose recovery had been remarkable thanks to the combined skills of Antonio and Bianca, and who could now climb and leap almost as well as if she had been back to her full fitness, wanted to accompany him, but Antonio, to her anger, vetoed this. It crossed Ezio's mind that Antonio, in the end, considered him more expendable than her, but he brushed off the thought and prepared himself for the reconnaissance mission, strapping on his left arm the Codex Guard Brace with its double dagger, and, on his right, the original spring blade. He had a lot of difficult climbing to do, and he didn't want to risk the poison blade since, in any circumstances, it was a truly lethal weapon, and he was keen to avoid any accident with it that might prove fatal to himself. Pulling his hood up over his head, and using the new techniques of upward leaping which Rosa and Franco had taught him, he stormed up the outer walls of the palazzo, silent as a shadow, and drawing less attention, until he was on its roof and looking down into its garden. There he noticed two men in deep conversation. They were making for a side gate leading to a narrow, private canal which led round the back of the palazzo. Following their progress from the roof, Ezio could see that a gondola was moored at a little jetty there, its two gondoliers clad in black and its lanterns doused. Sure-footed as a gecko on the roofs and walls, he hastened down and sheltered himself in the branches of a tree from which he could hear their conversation. The two men were Emilio Barbarigo and, as Ezio recognised with a shock, none other than Carlo Grimaldi, one of Doge Mocenigo's entourage. They were accompanied by Emilio's secretary, a spindly man dressed in grey, whose heavy reading glasses kept slipping down his nose. "'Your little house of cards is crumbling, Emilio,' Grimaldi was saying. It's a minor setback, nothing more. The merchants who defy me and that piece of shit Antonio de Majanis will soon be dead or in chains, or working the oars of a Turkish galley. I'm talking about the assassin. He's here, you know. That's what's made Antonio so bold. Look, we've all been robbed or burgled, and our guardsmen have been outsmarted. It's as much as I've been able to do to keep the doge from poking his nose in. The assassin, here. You numbskull, Emilio. If the master knew how stupid you are, you'd be dead meat. You know the damage he's already done to our cause in Florence and San Gimignano. Emilio made a fist of his right hand. I'll crush him like the bedbug he is, he snarled. 
Well, he's certainly sucking the blood out of you. Who knows if he's not here now, listening to us as we speak? Now, Carlo, you'll be telling me next you believe in ghosts. Grimaldi fixed him with his eyes. Arrogance has made you stupid, Emilio. You do not see the whole picture. You're nothing but a big fish in a small pond. Emilio grabbed him by the tunic and pulled him close, angrily. Venice will be mine, Grimaldi. I provided all the armaments to Florence. Not my fault if that idiot Jacopo didn't use them wisely. And don't try to make things bad for me with the master. If I wanted to, I could tell him some things about you which would save your breath. I must go now. Remember, the meeting is set ten days from now at San Stefano, outside Fiorellas. I'll remember, said Emilio sourly. The master will hear then how... The master will speak, and you will listen, retorted Grimaldi. Farewell. He stepped into the darkened gondola as Ezio watched, and it glided off into the night. Cazzo, muttered Emilio to his secretary as he watched the gondola disappear in the direction of the Grand Canal. What if he's right? What if that damned Ezio Auditore is here? He brooded for a moment. Look, get the boatman ready now. Wake the bastards up if you have to. I want those crates loaded now, and I want the boat ready in half an hour by your water clock. If Grimaldi is speaking the truth, I must find a place to hide, at least until the meeting. The master will find a way of dealing with the assassin. He must be working with Antonio de Majanis, put in the secretary. I know that, you idiot, hissed Emilio. Now come and help me pack the documents we spoke of before our dear friend Grimaldi came calling. They moved back towards the interior of the palazzo, and Ezio followed, giving away no more sense of his presence than if he had been a spirit. He blended into the shadows, and his footfall was no more noticeable than a cat's. He knew Antonio would hold off the attack on the palazzo until he gave the signal, and first he wanted to get to the bottom of what Emilio was up to, what were these documents of which he had spoken? Why won't people listen to sense? Emilio was saying to his secretary as Ezio continued to tell them. All this freedom of opportunity, it just leads to more crime. We must ensure that the state has control of all aspects of the people's lives and at the same time gives free rein to the bankers and the private financiers. That way, society flourishes. And if those who object have to be silenced then that is the price of progress. The assassins belong to a bygone age. They don't realise that it's the state that matters, not the individual. He shook his head. Just like Giovanni Auditore, and he was a banker himself. You'd have thought he'd have shown more integrity. Ezio drew in his breath sharply at the mention of his father's name, but continued to pursue his quarry as Emilio and his secretary made their way to his office selected papers, packed them, and returned to the little jetty by the garden gate where another, larger gondola was now awaiting its master. Emilio, taking his satchel of papers from his secretary, snapped a last order. Send some overnight clothes after me. You know the address. The secretary bowed and disappeared. There was no one else about. The gondoliers prepared to cast off fore and aft. Ezio sprang from his vantage point onto the gondola, which rocked alarmingly. With two swift elbow movements, he knocked the boatman into the water, and then had Emilio by the throat. Guards! Guards! gurgled Emilio, groping for the dagger at his belt. Ezio seized his wrist just as he was about to plunge the weapon into Ezio's belly. Not so fast, said Ezio. Assassin! You! growled Emilio. Yes. I killed your enemy. That does not make you my friend. Killing me will solve nothing for you, Ezio. I think it will rid Venice of a troublesome bedbug, said Ezio, releasing his spring blade. Requiescat in pace. With barely a pause, Ezio eased the deadly steel between Emilio's shoulder blades. 
death came quickly and silently. Ezio's proficiency in killing was matched only by the cold metallic resolve with which he fulfilled the duty of his calling. Bundling Emilio's body over the gondola's side, Ezio set to rifling through the papers in his satchel. There was much to interest Antonio, he thought, as he swiftly sifted through them, for there was no time now to examine them thoroughly. But there was one parchment which caught his own attention, a rolled and sealed page of vellum. Surely another codex page. As he was about to break the seal, shoof! An arrow rattled and clanged into the baseboard of the gondola between his legs. Instantly alert, Ezio crouched, peering up in the direction the missile had come from. High above him on the ramparts of the palazzo, a vast number of Barbarigo archers was ranged. Then one of them waved, and acrobatically tumbled down from the high walls. In another second, she was in his arms. Sorry, Ezio. Foolish prank but we couldn't resist. Rosa, she snuggled, back in the fray and ready for action. She looked at him with shining eyes. And the Palazzo Seta is taken. We have freed the merchants who opposed Emilio, and we now control the district. Now come, Antonio is planning a celebration, and Emilio's wine cellars are legendary. Time passed and Venice seemed to be at peace. No one mourned Emilio's disappearance. Indeed, many believed him still to be alive, and some assumed he had just gone on a journey abroad to look after his business interests in the Kingdom of Naples. Antonio made sure that the Palazzo Seta still ran like clockwork, and as long as the mercantile interests of Venice as a whole were not affected, nobody really cared about the fate of one businessman however ambitious or successful he may have been. Ezio and Rosa had grown closer, but a fierce rivalry still existed between them. Now she was healed, she wanted to prove herself, and one morning she came to his rooms and said, Listen, Ezio, I think you need a retune. I want to see if you're still as good as you became when Franco and I first trained you. So... How about a race? A race? Yes. Where? From here to the Punta della Dogana. Starting now! And she leapt out of the window before Ezio could react. He watched her as she scampered over the red rooftops and seemed almost to dance across the canals that separated the buildings. Throwing off his tunic, he raced after her. At last they arrived, neck and neck, on the rooftop of the wooden building that stood on the spit of land at the end of the Dorsoduro, overlooking St. Mark's Canal and the lagoon. Across the water stood the low buildings of the monastery of San Giorgio Maggiore, and opposite, the shimmering pink stone edifice, which was the Palazzo Ducale. Looks like I won, said Ezio. She frowned. Nonsense. Anyway, even by saying that, you show yourself to be no gentleman and certainly no Venetian. But what can one expect of a Florentine? She paused. In any case, you're a liar. I won. Ezio shrugged and smiled. Whatever you say, carissima. Then, to the victor, the spoils, she said, pulling his head down to hers and kissing him passionately upon the lips. Her body now was soft and warm, and infinitely yielding. <laughs>